Richard Nash has worked as a theater director. He has run a theater. He became one of book publishing's foremost thinkers by asking all of the stupid questions, bringing curiosity to the topic, taking little for granted, diving in with the power of the beginner's mind. He worked with a variety of innovative startups, was publisher at Soft Skill Press from 2001 to 2009, and is now a coach helping creatives, notably in publishing, to navigate shifting terrain using conversation to transform by asking genuinely motivated questions. He wrote a much lauded article entitled The Business of Literature, which is what I'd like to discuss in part one of our conversation. And then in part two, I'd like to pick uh, pick up where he leaves off. So, Richard, what is the business of literature? I'm going to be interviewing David from shortly. Oh my goodness. Fascinating. And uh, he has written two books capitalizing on the name Trump. Yeah. His ideas aren't disruptive. They are prescriptive in the second book. So he's using, in my uh, assessment of what's going on. He's, he's using books as a vehicle to get all sorts of exposure on podcasts and television programs to talk about his prescription. Yeah, at times I think of the book as being a little bit like a marathon. Running a marathon is something that we as a species take seriously. It's arbitrary. Why, I mean, why 26.2 miles? Yes, it was the different distance from the battlefield to, to uh, uh, Athens or whatever it was. But fundamentally, 26.2 miles is a, is a completely arbitrary number. But we place great, great import on the fact that somebody ran a marathon. And writing a book has a certain similarity to that, I find. Mm -hmm. It's this sort of 
epic solo act, climbing a mountain, climbing Everest on your own, mm. uh, circumnavigating the globe on your own. It's this epic act, and, and we just sort of say, somebody who has completed this epic act must have something to say, <laughs> must mean something. Yes. They're serious, you'd think. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you and I know that maybe that's not entirely true, but... There's something to it. And, and one of the things that I've found interesting when you look at maybe somebody like David Frum or somebody who's a professor or somebody who's at a think tank or somebody who's an independent scholar without an affiliate, when a journalist name checks a person who's being quoted in an interview, if they have a book, they will name check them as author of insert name of book. Yeah. Even if they're also director for the center or for the study of, you know, A, Z, and F, or even if they're also a professor of this, that, and the other thing at this university, the actual shorthand that we, the journalists, use for describing the authority or describing basically, why am I asking this person? It's because they wrote the book. It's credentials, so, isn't it? Yeah. And so with From, the odds are that the audience he reaches via television and podcast and, and by being quoted and, and, and so on and so forth is vastly larger than the number of people who actually read the book. The book is sort of recognized as a kind of a legitimate move in a chess game, and a sort of a permanent, permanent chess game of, of, of culture and society. And so the, here is, David Frum just made this move. Let's talk to him about what this move means. <laughs> the, the, the book is the container or is the mode of execution by which a serious move is made in the never-ending chess game of debating who we are and what it all means. That's not to say that it doesn't have content. I mean, the book is the, the best way to present a complicated or in-depth idea to the world. Sure, 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 sure. You're, yeah. I don't mean to downplay that, uh, but that, I guess what I'm almost trying to do is say there is what we just discussed, and you're right, that another thing the book does, and they're not unrelated to one another, uh, although certainly looking at some certain books, the reality is, is you could have put it all into 10 pages, uh, you know, certain, not all books, but if there's certain books that are sort of Ten pages stretched out to reach three hundred pages. The Celestine but, prophecy. <laughs> but yes, you know it's it's the other reason, and in a sense, maybe it is the deeper reason why books remain relevant. Is that we we do actually kind of notice when the fifty pages turn into three hundred. But that's when the advertising is false, Richard. When the advertising basically says this is a really important book that you need to read. And right. unfortunately, nine out of ten books, or maybe not quite that high, don't live up to the hype. Right, yeah. But yes, there is a way in which for a book to be a book, you're talking about a kind of a process of layering and counter-argumenting, setting up something that is more than a straw horse, knocking it down, examining the entrails, wondering what it means, shifting around over, coming back to it, you know, a hundred 
hundred pages later and saying, oh, we thought it meant Y, but really it meant X. It's durational. You know, the, the really great books in some sense are also like works of, of durational art, like Spiral Jetty, those, those great uh, environmental uh, art pieces out in the desert or, or uh, out in a lake who, who kind of atrophy or, or weather, you know, some object weathers over decades. But, but, but yeah, you, to, 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 for a book to be a book in the sense in which you're describing, it, it effectively is that which is sort of unfolding, that which is kind of like has a series of motions and multiple complicated moves inside right, the container, and that you get to encounter the process by which the conclusions have been arrived at, as opposed to just here's the conclusion. You you you'll get the conclusion on the podcast, uh, you'll get the conclusion on the TV thing, the two-minute version, mm -hmm. and then the book is where you follow along the complex journey that allows you to understand and how the conclusion was arrived at. Ideally, in a scientific sense, I mean, so much of what drove the publishing becoming publishing was the scientific revolution, right? And, and processes that, that, that sort of have evolved into the history and, and the disciplines of the history of science and the philosophy of science. And things like falsification, right? The ability to to sort of see your work, as they say to the students. I want to see your work. I want to see how you arrived at mm. that. So I can see, oh, was this a guest work? Did you arrive at the correct answer purely by accident? <laughs> In a sense, books allow you, force you to disclose your method and your process so that it can be examined by others in a kind of extended and ideally contemplative kind of way. Yes, and so publishers have historically presented that thinking, that printed thinking. But what you say in this piece, and I, I'm going to jump to the, the end of it, the conclusion, and then come back to the beginning, okay? Um, okay. The business of literature is not about making art. It's about making culture, which is a conversation about what art is, what's true and good. So it seems that what you're doing is sort of disappearing traditional publishing here. You're jumping straight from the author writing to the author talking with others. Uh, in different ways about the writing. And so my question is, you got into coaching because what? This allows you to talk directly one-on-one -on -one to these authors about how they would talk about their books? Interesting. Jumping over the publisher. I guess, hmm, that's interesting, that's interesting. So, so there's a debate I have had with myself over the years. Do I want to be somebody who makes a small difference in the lives of a large number of people? Or a big difference in the lives of a small number of people? And that's been a struggle I've, I've, I've had, you know, since I sort of came of age as an adult, which I wanted. Did I want to be, you know, and, and I've gone, I've kind of oscillated. I've tried being a writer, mostly via theater, which at least in theory is small difference in large number. The large number isn't very large, but communicating with a bunch of people you don't know. I did, you know, some writing that was not for theater. But often I was, I feel like I've spent a lot of time chasing scale. 
trying to figure out how do I how do I scale this more. I spent a lot of time doing startups in the 2000 teens, trying to figure out. Okay, we know how one way how publishing scales. What are some of the other ways in which we can scale? Having seen what what kind of scale really means when you're talking about internet scale, and I I don't know that I didn't figure it out. I mean, you know, there's just so much startups are are, are you know some succeed, some do, most vast majority don't. But I do know that I was getting dissatisfied with chasing scale for its own sake. And there was some kind of big impact, an intimate impact that I wanted to have personally. It was about me. You know, it's not saying this is how everyone should do it. It was just what was my, what were the real itches of my own that I needed to scratch. And, and in the sense that meant to really do that right, I had to kind of walk away from the processes of chasing scale. And fundamentally, publishing as an industry, as an activity, is a chasing of scale. Can you, can you uh, drill down on that for me, Richard? It's well, basically, you know, in a weird way, publishing... One of the things that uh, that really kind of motivated me to to kind of write that essay, what is the business of literature, um, or or what it didn't motivate me to write it, but it was like galvanizing me as I was writing it was this realization that above all, fundamentally, what is remarkable about publishing is the first ever industry we created. Yeah. It was the first time humans could do anything at scale. You know, we could produce books an order of magnitude faster than we could produce spears or bows and arrows or mm -hmm. any kind of weaponry. I mean, again, again, that great book by David Edgerton, The Shock of the Old, uh, which is a kind of a beautiful history of technology. One of the things it loves to point out is how almost everything we've done as humans has been driven by the desire to create weapons. <laughs> <laughs> One exception to that. Right. <laughs> That's why women should rule the world. And so fundamentally, when, when we really, like, when humans were like, I want to make a lot of something. <laughs> yeah. What do I want to make a lot of? Right. Turns out the first thing we really want to make a lot of is things that let us express ourselves. We well, I mean, the first thing, the first that. thing, the first thing was obviously, you know, a book that expressed all sorts of rules and regulations. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, the most successful books of all time have been you know, the two great books of the monotheistic religions, right? The Bible and the Quran. And in a sense, you know, the most economically efficient book, therefore, is, you know, the, the most economically efficient industry in the world, other than an internet, a, you know, analog industry in the world, would be basically if we only ever read one book, we could call it the Bible. <laughs> uh, because that's where we would get the lowest possible unit cost. Uh, we only had to, we never had to change anything. So, you know, there would just be this, what, all these, the most efficient machines we could possibly make, and all they had to do was produce one facsimile thing over and over and over and over and over again. In actual publishing, right, because standard independent publishing print run might run from anywhere from 1,000 copies to 5,000 copies, let's say. And, and when you go to the printer and you get a quote for 1,000 copies, they'll say it's $3,500. And you say, what's 5,000? And they'll say $5,500. 
No, I was going to say thirty-six hundred dollars. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Almost all the cost of, of, of printing the book is in setting the machine up. The marginal cost is so small in the sense that publishing prefigures the internet. And that's another thing that I was sort of trying to get at uh, in that essay is how, how, how the really remarkable move was the move that publishing made. And in the sense, the internet is just an extension of this discovery of the capacity for scale uh, that we have. Because in a sense, it's sort of like the internet is just taking that to the, to the, to the nth degree of we're going to spend, you know, $100 billion setting up a bunch of fiber optic cable and a whole bunch of servers and build a whole bunch of software. And it's going to take, you know, an extra... Twenty million dollars a year just to keep it all functioning. <laughs> so it's sort of like the fixed cost of printing is amortized, you know, with very, very rapidly declining marginal cost. And, and just the internet is almost the same, except the marginal cost declines even more rapidly. Now, to some degree, it, is, it really, really is way, 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 way more rapid. But Compared to, it costs, you know, a dollar to produce one thing, another dollar to produce the next thing, and another dollar to produce the third, and another dollar to produce the fourth. That, the fact that publishing was not that economics. It was a whole other economics. It was the first time we humans got there to this, like, holy shit, I have to do all this work. But once I do all this work, it's trivially expensive to just keep doing it again and again and again and again and again. Well, also uh, with uh, with subscription models, doesn't cost you a nickel to to, to bring on uh, extra subscribers. Well, that's yeah, and you know, you're, what's really interesting there in terms of what you just said is it it, it it addresses the other side. So what we just said is we're sort of describing supply and yeah. how supply scales, and basically what you just described is the other side of it is like how do you scale to mass? How do you what 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 the what the startup what the venture capitalists who who, who fund startups and, and the people at the startups who need to persuade venture capitalists to part with their money, what they would call customer acquisition costs, C A C. You know, that's one of the most important numbers in a startup is is how much does of cost to acquire the next customer. And as you say, with a subscription model in, in, in publishing, and again, publishing was the first, because it was the first industry, it was also the first industry to start to figure out, oh, how to lower my customer acquisition costs by, by actually getting the customer, not just to buy a single product, but to commit to buy multiple products over an extended period of time. Uh, and to have a, a relationship with the customer, as they say. So yeah, that 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 is the that is the other side of the economic of the economics of of you know what's just not economics is where does the demand come from? And yes, you're right. Subscription is is a great business if you can if you have the products that people want. You uh, reference in your article three books that apply vigorous empirical research to contemporary publishing and they are The Merchants of Culture by J.B. Thompson, Ted Strippa's The Late Age of Print and Laura Miller's Reluctant Capitalists. Could you just quickly give a thumbnail of those books and why they're so important? Yeah, well, uh, Laura Miller's book is just a really, it, it, it's the most kind of pragmatic account of independent book selling. You know, most book-length accounts of book selling, well, I mean, there aren't that many anymore, but, but to the extent that they existed, they were the sort of very um, romantic, romantic books. They, they, they were almost stories rather than sort of analyses. Uh, happy stories, sad stories, happy, sad stories, you know. Uh, and sort of Laura kind of goes in there with a kind of uh, part sociolog 
anthropologist part anthropologist's eye. Ted's book, you know, that book is is one of those dissertations turned into a book. So it's one of those things where you read, where you get like three or four big, meaty chapters. Uh, and there is a kind of an introduction, conclusion, through line. But it's not quite the, the great two set pieces in it for me. One was about Oprah and the book club. And what Ted sort of realized was that, or certainly what my reading of Ted allowed me to realize, is that with Oprah's genius, you know, Oprah was kind of running a, 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 a middling rated TV show up until she did the book club. When she did the book club, she got big. It wasn't like, you know, these TV shows have been doing book clubs on and off for years and they went pretty well. Oprah's was a whole other order of magnitude kind of thing. And I, that was because she was using the book as a proxy for herself. Well, I was about to say, she picked books that she herself was passionate about. Yes. And what that allowed was for the book then, it was like, if you were at Oprah's book club, you were, it was as if Oprah herself was a friend of yours. And when you mm -hmm. were sitting down reading the book on the toilet, you know, or when you were sitting with your friend who's in the book club with you at work at the cafeteria, Oprah was there with you. Oprah right. was in bed with you when you were reading the book. It was a way for Oprah to basically extend her kind of narrative or emotional or dialogic tentacles into the life of her audience 24-7 and vice versa. You know, it, it, it basically allowed several million almost entirely women to have a converse, to have conversations about shame, guilt, mm. regret, desire, joy, family, like the big elements of, of, of a human's sort of day-to-day -day life that people weren't always comfortable discussing with strangers or, or, or distant acquaintances, but somehow the book made them all like best friends. They got to be all the best friends with one another, with Oprah as the sort of primus inter pares best friend. And, and so uh, he also does, Ted also did some very good work around showing how it, the idea of like the, the opposition between chains and independent bookstores was not quite as, as uh, uh, zero sum game or even negative sum game as, as, as people might have assumed in the 90s and the 2000s. He does a great exploration of the uh, area of North Carolina that was without any bookstores and their efforts to get a Barnes and Noble to set up there, the, the, the community and local politicians to get a Barnes and Noble to set up there. And it, it sort of very much sort of knocked me off a kind of a narrow understanding of, of um, you know, what's good and what's evil in book selling. And I think, again, that, that kind of intersection of anthropology and sociology was going on there as well. I, I find that a kind of a useful, and, and I get with actually with Ted now, that, and not Ted, with, with, with John Thompson, with J.B. Thompson. He has both a, a, a kind of a field anthropologist approach to research, these sort of long extended interviews with people who work in publishing, with hundreds of people. I mean, his, his research model is not dissimilar from from your, the history of your podcast, really. I mean, your podcast could be raw material for a J.B. Thompson book. But yeah, that was his, but even he's more trained as a, as a political sociologist. So... It was, it was a way to kind of ask probing questions. And some of the people he interviewed, like he interviewed me four times, three times for that book and another time for a book that he's in the process of finishing 
over like several years. So it allowed him to also even, you know, with the, yeah, and I wasn't the only person he interviewed multiple times, and that sort of a, a, a allowed him to really get a rich sense of the evolving norms and expectations and anxieties and pessimisms and optimisms of all the players inside an industry, you know, a publishing industry that was actually never very good at talking about itself from from a distance. You know, we we would have various romantic accounts of what it is that we would do from a first person standpoint, but very little actual pragmatic research. We're not used to being the guinea pigs or the uh, hamsters or the the test subjects. We're closing in on 10 o'clock here, uh, Richard, and I think I've covered about a tenth of what I <laughs> had hoped. <laughs> I should make the observation, though, that what we're doing, of course, is precisely what publishing can do. The business of literature is not about making art. It's about making culture, which is a conversation about what art is, what's true and good. So, we're publishing right now? We are... <laughs> okay, so there's, there's a... <laughs> there's a kind of a joke. So when, when uh, the great American Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, was made in 1974, I think it was, there was a lot of questioning of like where exactly in the Constitution uh, the right to an abortion existed. And there was a phrase, penumbra and emanations, that the sort of the, the right to privacy, the sort of the, the zone of privacy that a human has to make decisions in her this case exclusively for pretty much her life, but in the lives of any citizen uh, that, that, that the state can't kind of extend into and, and um, prohibit, let's say, came from the penumbra and emanation of the Constitution. Right. So it's sort of like, it's what's between the lines. You say the reading between the lines of the Constitution. And I would say, like, what you and I are, we are, we, we are not necessarily writing the book right now, nor are we in the act of publishing the book right now. But this kind of a conversation is the, the field on which the sort of net, the sort of rich conversation that, that books trigger and that are the reason we read books. So, you know, since we read books in order to have conversations like you and I are having. Like, if I read those three books that we talked about uh, and said nothing about them to anybody ever. Yes. Weird. <laughs> It'd be like a tree falling in the forest, wouldn't it? Yeah, there's, there's, well, 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 there is something fundamentally private about the act of reading. It is also the case that once we have commenced to that private act, we can think of nothing more that we want to do than be in some way public about it by like telling our friends or arguing with our friends about it, whether it's the next day or a decade later. The publishers of those three books we mentioned, right, in a sense we are a part of the process of publishing mm -hmm. that they set in motion by having published uh, those three books. Yeah, I mean, we're the readers that complete it, for one thing. Yeah. You make a very interesting point about publishers leaving a lot of money on the table in sort of two ways. A, a book, you say, quite beautifully, is transformative and when you get into a big beautiful novel that transports you uh, 
you experience something akin to taking a wonderful cruise, for example, and for that you pay the price of a t-shirt versus five or six or seven thousand bucks to go on the cruise. So that's really fascinating. And then the other part is what we've just discussed. The publisher, again, not capitalizing on the book culture or the conversation that you talk about in ways that they possibly could. I think they're getting better and better at the latter. I, I, I feel like there's a there's been a kind of a democratizing of the conversation around around books that what you know what began with book bloggers in the early 2000s you know the the decline of traditional newspapers which you know in, 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 in you know there are, there's I'm not saying there's not losses there's there's swings and roundabouts with everything but there is I think an increasingly rich and perceptible flow of conversation that I think publishers are getting increasingly better at participating in. But are they capitalizing uh, in on it? Well, yeah, that's interesting. You know, when you said capitalizing specifically that exact verb, it got me very excited because <laughs> there is a way in which I am, I, I, am I an apologist for capitalism? I think I think capitalism will always have to be contended with. It's not going to be eradicated. There is something going on. And the, the sort of notion that capitalism is contrary to publishing is sort of disproved by every element of the fiber of publishing being uh, at its very existence and genesis. So, so we have to contend with greed and money no matter what we do. And risk. So... And risk, yes, yes, yes. And so, so certainly it's, I mean, the cruise example was a lovely example. I wish I could come up with that one. But yes, it's uh, a, a really perfect example. And, and, you know, you see magazines do it. Like the Nation magazine, like, has this thing where they're like, hey, do a cruise to Alaska Alexander Coburn and Katrina Van Den Heuvel and a couple of other uh, <laughs> editors will be on the cruise and there'll be talks and there'll be authors and it'll be fabulous, you know. Yeah. Um, Globe and Mail has just and, done that in Canada. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would love to see publishers do so much more of that. I know it's not realistic for publishers to execute it themselves, but it's not like the Globe and Mail went out and hired uh, and rented a, a cruise ship. They went to some yeah. company that does cruise ships. Right. What about a special theme thing that uses our journalists? You know, we'll talk about politics. Just as an aside, I think David Frum's on the cruise, even though he doesn't write for the Globe. Yes. David Frum wrote a book. He might not. Uh, one of the ways in which he has captured the value that he's made in the book is getting a free cruise. <laughs> he's brilliant. Oh, he's brilliant at uh, creating culture. <laughs> if that's what if that's what you want to call it. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm only going to let you go if you promise to allow me to continue this conversation over. I'm guessing it's probably going to be about two more of these, maybe three. Sure, 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 sure. that would be fun. I'd like to do it within the next six months, let's say. Yes, let's do that. Very good. Let's do that. Thank you so much, Nigel. Thank you, Richard. Richard, uh, could, do you want to just describe what you're doing now for the publishing world uh, and, and elsewhere? is a kind of, it's like a cross between therapy and management consulting, and it's really about really helping individuals figure out what they really want to do and how they really want to do it, and about overcoming the various things that get in your way, many of which are often 
often kind of ingrained habits or fears that stop you from being, as Oprah might say, your best self now. <laughs> well, plus I read somewhere that you want to help people rock. There you go. <laughs> Good. I want to help people rock and I want to help people blow shit up. Thank you, Richard. Bye, Nigel. <laughs>